thank you very much. Uh, well, I w actually plan to say something about, okay, if you really want to so see something spectacular, you shouldn't be here, but uh, there's so few of you that I'm afraid I'm just going to present to an empty room if I do that now. So I'm just going to start, okay? Um, yeah, like this. Okay, that's the content of my presentation, just shortly about myself and about the company which I work for. And then we're going to get into the interesting stuff, a little bit about the uh, background on the project itself. And then the most important part, which is uh, the role of FME in the project, and uh, finish it up with some uh, conclusions and results. So um, I started uh, studying forestry a long, long time ago, and I found out something about uh, called GIS, and I was like, wow, that's interesting stuff. Let's, let's try and do some, do some more of that stuff which eventually led to uh, masters in geoinformation. And that's where I can say the, the assimilation process started, uh, uh, in my case. Um, as uh, Steve, Steve mentioned, I'm a certified FME professional trainer. I've been doing uh, FME work for a long time and I'm uh, still quite enthusiastic about FME and I'm happy to say that I hear a lot of things, a lot of people use the correct terminology, which is workspace and not workbench. But I get really upset if people that consider themselves professionals say, oh, I created this workbench and that workbench, which is naturally not the correct term. Um, as uh, Steve also mentioned, I have a lot of experience desktop, server, and cloud. Um, and I'm currently working at the National Railway Management Organization in the Netherlands. Uh, and they reside in this amazing building. It's the largest brick building in the Netherlands, which is also a monument. And yes, there is a spaceship on the roof. I didn't Photoshop that into it. Uh, well, a little bit about Tenzing. Uh, we are based in the Netherlands and uh, a, little bit, a little office uh, across the pond in the US. Um, we're uh, uh, the first solution partners, European solution partners of uh, safe software, I'm glad to say. And we are also S3 Gold partners. Just uh, uh, There are two companies in the Netherlands that have that status, and we are one of them. Very happy to do that. And we are Microsoft uh, partners as well. Somebody spent uh, a lot of time thinking about this slogan, and I'm happy to see that it fits with what uh, Commander Hatfield and Don and Dale actually also say. To make better decisions, you need to have a better understanding uh, and it's all about data. Uh, we at Tenzing, we are focused on two applications, so ESRI and uh, Safe Software FME, and we believe that if we have the right certification and the right focus, we can provide, provide the best added value to our customers. These are some of our, uh, of our uh, clients. As you see, we're mostly into utilities and asset managers and uh, big governmental organizations. Um, Probably most of those companies are unknown to you, but if you ever flew into the Netherlands, then you probably landed at Schiphol or airport. And uh, if you drive one of those cars that still need something other than a battery, then you probably recognize another one of those companies. Okay, enough of the corporate stuff. Uh, a little bit about the VMD VBGR project. Um, the project uh, was about two water companies in the northeast of the Netherlands. And yeah, in the Netherlands we have about seven water companies and those two are basically uh, companies that provide water to about a million people in the Netherlands. And they manage something uh, in the order of 120,000 kilometers of pipelines basically. Um, those two companies started a long time ago using a small world-based application with the same data model, the same schema, and through the years they started deviating and using their own fields, and basically that's where we had to do the consolidation in our project. The goal of the project was basically to migrate from that small world-based NRM application into the ArcGIS for water uh, utility. And there was no turning back. Basically, we had to shut down the small world application and they had to continue production into using the SRI uh, uh, product. Um, what we used was an agile scrum uh, methodology. Um, is there anybody here who doesn't know what agile scrum is? OK, 
Okay. Well, that picture over there basically describes it all in one go. You basically have a write down a lot of desirable things you want to have, and that's called the product backlog. And you divide your work into sprints. And each sprint, you um, <coughs> sorry <coughs> define what kind of work, what kind of desirable product you're going to do. And through that sprint, you basically go and develop a solution for that sprint. And you, in that way, you are actually incrementally basically delivering the solution until uh, the project is end. It's a cyclic approach which and flexible, which actually allows you to, <coughs> sorry, to uh, adjust to the requirements of the client. So if the clients decide in sprint one that they want something and in sprint two they change their mind, then you can actually uh, uh, change and adapt to that changes. And <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it, they usually, the development team includes the company itself, the clients, and also, of course, the company that provides the solution. And in this case, we also had ESRI uh, uh, involved, uh, delivering some support and uh, also some training to the company on how to use this new water utility. We basically divided the, the work into 14 sprints, each of uh, uh, two weeks' time. And in totally, the, the project duration was uh, nine months. So if you calculate it, it won't come up, but there was some vacation in between. That's why it was. So getting back into uh, the most important part, uh, um, the role of FME was actually quite substantial because it was a migration project. Um, what we did is basically uh, inventorize what are the types of features or feature classes, if you use the S3 terminology, that they have in the, da in the database and divided that to group, uh, we grouped that per sprint. <coughs> we worked with multiple developers, uh, FME developers, and we, we used uh, Team Foundation as our source control for that. Uh, we completely automated that, so we actually got all the time the latest version of our workspaces that way. Um, generally speaking, you can basically say we created two types of uh, workspaces. So migration generic workspaces that do some pre-processing or generic stuff, and then for each sprint, based on each features that were grouped for that sprint, a sprint-specific workspace. Um, basically, we used all of FME's key capabilities, as you see, to eventually that led to the migration of the data. So we converted data from format A to format B. We did some validation uh, um, while converting. We integrated the different data sources into uh, uh, the desirable um, output, and we did some data transformation when necessary. So if I look at the one of a uh, schematic overview of such a data migration workspace, what we can see here is that we did some, we used FME all over the place. We gathered data from different applications. We did, of course, exports. Uh, we used FME to export the data from the small world application into FFS, and we loaded that into the cloud. On the other side of the cloud, we used FME to download the data verify that everything is there before we went uh, uh, further with the data. And we did also some pre-processing, such as uh, cal calculation of rotations and, and uh, so on, so that it can assist us later on in the, uh, in the total migration script. This is one of such uh, sprint-specific uh, workspace. This is actually from the first sprint where we moved the pipeline network actually in one go to uh, a file geo database. Um, and what we did in it was also not just move the data, but we did also some kind of validation and reporting if there are uh, objects we did not uh, measure up to the output. We wrote them down to a, uh, an output file so that in the next sprint they could actually be adjusted in the source application because every sprint we basically incremented the migration. So we moved the features of the pipelines in the first sprint, in the second sprint other features, but still the first features of the, uh, the pipelines were moved each and every 
part of the migration again and again and again. So if they had some ba bad data, they could basically correct the data in their own source application, and it would be moved and moved and moved and moved each time. This is a schematic overview of the migration itself. Uh, we used FME server uh, notification capabilities uh, to trigger the migration, basically. Um, it's maybe important to mention that we were not, uh, uh, it was not our goal, or it was not in our, uh, we were not responsible for the, for the data itself. We, the data and the delivery of the data was actually in the hands of the um, client. But we did, of course, a system with building workspaces to extract the data. Um, so what we did is basically uh, uh, had a uh, controller workspace in which each of the sprint workspaces was actually triggered to, to be performed. And that was um, eventually written to a file due database and uploaded to FTP. So I can see everybody thinking, so why didn't you write it straight away into the corporate database? Well, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, the reason we didn't do that is because next to, the, uh, uh, next to the migration, the wishes of the client were changing through each and other sprint. And the schema needed to evolve as well. So that's why we actually wrote it to a temporary database which was later on, together with the def definite schema, was loaded into the corporate database at one time. So this is uh, the big guy. This is the controller workspace. Uh, I'm, no, I'm not going to go into too much details about it, but uh, what it is essentially is a lot of workspace runners, basically. So each bookmark, what you see, is actually a sprint and the workspaces that were used in that sprint, or at least uh, a workspace runner that calls that specific workspace, and sometimes multiple workspaces. And what we did use is also FME server, basically to let us know if something went wrong, or um, by emailing ourselves uh, in case the migration went bad. Um, as you can see here, this is a pre-tunnel uh, uh, FME version, or as I like to call them, einstein rosa bridges. I don't know why that name didn't pick up, because, but it got mentioned in the blog, so I'm happy about that. Um, and um, yeah, so um, once we fired up this big guy, I was kind of oscillating between these two states. I mean, we did practice all the time. Uh, through the, throughout the whole project, but I mean, you know, you're nervous. You, it has to go well because they have to shut down the project and uh, their application and continue working in SRI. So eventually after 10 hours and 1. million features and no notification email, uh, everything went well and we could celebrate and, yeah, breathe easily. <laughs> well, to wrap it up, um, as I stated before, uh, the migration was basically an incremental thing. So every sprint we move features, or a group of features, which moved also in the second sprint and the third sprint and the fourth sprint. So we basically practiced the migration throughout the whole project. So, um, and the possibility to iterate the migration necessary for in such an agile framework was actually uh, very useful because uh, the client could basically, uh, while the project was running, continue to work and improve the data so it could eventually be migrated into the new application. If you know your way around into FM, in FME, then data analysis and reporting is really easy to do. And in, my, uh, the, in a desktop environment, uh, such a combination of source control is a really easy way to share the workspaces within the team. Of course, if you work with FME server, then I would use FME server for that. Well, to really finish up my presentation, some conclusions and results. Um, it was a successful migration. We did it in one go. Everybody was happy. I was relieved. <laughs> uh, it was also within time and budget, and we actually uh, could do some uh, more work and more functionality which they desired uh, that was actually um, 
not incorporated in the first estimates, and those were basically interfaces with, uh, for example, SIP and uh, import of CAD uh, data. It's the first kind of its kind in the Netherlands. Uh, we are actually hope that there will be more of these kinds because we have another uh, a bunch of water companies and they were uh, very seriously interested in this project. And ESRI also, of course, it's, uh, they use this uh, quite a lot. My colleague uh, spoke also in the ESRI tech about this project, so more about the ESRI stuff. And personally, I really think that uh, FME and Agile, if you're doing migration, is definitely a framework you should consider because mm -hmm. it's, uh, in my personal opinion, a really perfect way to work. Uh, you define your goals and your goals are set for that specific sprint and you can easily iterate and iterate and get it better and better and fine tune it all the way. So to wrap it up, uh, I really think that uh, uh, there is no better tool for uh, migration than FME, and if you think otherwise, then we should have a chat. Thank you very much. Okay, so for the questions, if uh, you have a question, I'd love to give you the mic before you ask the question. Uh, does anybody have any questions? All right, coming right over. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, what were the, the main differences between Small World and, and Esri in terms of the, the data? In terms of the data, um, uh, yeah, good question. There, was, there were not that many big differences between the, um, it was more of a schema difference actually. And the part of consolidating between the two different schemas uh, going into one uh, output schema. So uh, the data itself, it was not in, in the objectives of the project to go and validate the data and to fix it. Uh, so uh, it was mainly schematic. Uh, that's where the difference was. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. So is it just a project for the data migration and getting it to the new model, or was there a bunch of app dev and other work going on too? Yeah, no, there were definitely a lot of work going on the SRI application later on. Uh, I'm just focusing on the FME part because that's the fun and the interesting part in my opinion. Uh, but again, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, work done on the SRI part to get it work working to get the people basically used to the new application. There was even a little bit of customization for annotation, for example, and so on. Yeah, there was more done. Well, the, the duration and the sprints were uh, uh, basically only about the migration. Afterwards, there was a uh, yeah, continuation to get the, the client basically used to the application and to make it uh, better and better. Do you know uh, how was the multiple geometries and null unset geometries handled on Esri side? That's a good question. Well, luckily, there weren't that many multiple geometries and in, uh, inside worlds and all that stuff that sm the small world has. It was quite a, a, a simple representation of geometry what they had already in the small world application. So there was not uh, there were not that many complex geometric uh, transformations that were needed. Anyone else? One more question from me. I always have that. It's oh, a good okay. question. Oh. Uh, I, I suspect what you have there is quite reusable. It's really just connecting to a source or a different source, and then from there on, build it back up. Is that how you see it? Well, I actually see it the other way around. I see it as a throwaway kind of a workspace. Right. Yeah, because uh, you don't know what uh, if if we would just reuse this in the next project, then you probably have to go through all the workspaces yeah, because the, enough, the, yeah. the, the, the source schema could be different. Yep. You're dealing with different attributes and so on and so on. But it was very, very uh, uh, helpful for new projects because now we have a framework. Right. So that's really yep. reusable for future migration projects, yes. Yep. Okay, anyone else? Oh. 
So with the different sprints, I'm just wondering, because we're also migrating into Esri, mm -hmm. and we're planning to migrate everything in, test for about a month, and then truncate and reload, basically do the migration again to cut over from production. Mm -hmm. Did you do that incrementally as part of the sprints and kind of transition them slowly, or did you do it all at once like no. that? No, we did that actually incrementally. So first, we, for example, we passed on the, uh, the, the water network, and then there was a team, uh, in the team there were people testing to see if everything was there, if it was according to their specs and so on and so yeah. on. And then the next sprint we moved another group of features and then they can concentrate the testing on that. Uh, so it was an incremental thing. And eventually towards the last, uh, almost the last sprint we did the whole migration so they could retest everything. And then eventually we did the whole uh, thing at at one go at eventually at the end. So it was very helpful actually for the testers to have it incrementally because otherwise you don't know what, where, and your test plan is going to be enormous. So if you have, if you have it grouped and if you have it specific, then you can really test also really well. Yeah. Great. Okay, well thank you everyone for your questions.